Is there a moment <clears throat> that you saw or something that, that set you off on this path to being a foreign correspondent? I don't think a moment. Um, I was um, five years old when I can remember um, Kennedy's assassination oh, right. and in 63 I think it was and I, that is my earliest memory of television news and whether subconsciously I just got thought this was, it was the most extraordinary thing to witness uh, whether that happened it was subconscious though because I never really thought about it it's only when I came to write the book that I you know yeah um, but I used to watch Sandy Gall and Brian Barron and Martin Bell and John Simpson and these sort of people and I used to think that is a life worth living and you know I'd love to do that and and I knew I think probably at the, about the age of 15 or 16 what I wanted to do mm -hmm. and and I just was very lucky enough to go and do it. Well in in 94 you became ITN's Africa correspondent mm. you were based in Johannesburg there and you said actually this this time and what you saw there was probably the most inspiring of, of all of your career. Why yeah. was that? Well I think it was just that the whole situation that South Africa when I arrived um, with my one-year-old son um, my wife was pregnant with my daughter and South Africa was on the verge of civil war really mm -hmm. um, and there was a huge question about whether this sort of rainbow nation would emerge. And I was covering this story and I got to meet Mandela several times, got to interview him several times. And I just witnessed this extraordinary man um, make sure that this thing happened and that these millions of people who had never had the vote, black people who had been oppressed for, for decades, um, Mandela, you know, lifted them out of this. He made yeah. sure there was a deal. He reached out to the white population. He did something I don't think anybody else could do and he brought that about and to witness that and to meet him. Yeah. He took me to Robin Island and um, we went into the cell and he showed me the cell and I said, this is, this is tiny. And he said, well, when I sleep, my feet touch one end and my head touches the other end. Mm. He said, but it's my fault for being so tall. Oh, wow. And this is the man, this yeah. is what it's like. With so him. at one side of Africa, this enormous and varied country, you are, you are looking at these inspirational, extraordinary, groundbreaking moments. And at the same time, you are covering the genocide in Rwanda? Well, we knew the genocide had started as Mandela was being um, um, confirmed as president and sworn in as president. And But we thought it was another bout of, um, you know, this tribal violence that happens so often in Rwanda. But it became very clear that it was something much, much worse. And yes, I spent the next few months basically in and out of Rwanda covering the genocide there where a million people were killed in a hundred days or something. So you describe it as harrowing and and there is one thing to be that foreign, co foreign correspondent to, to, to show the world for us through your eyes, your camera lens. Um, but, but at the other end, there is the personal impact that has on you. You say some of your colleagues, because of that, came away with PTSD. Oh, yeah, no question about that. I mean, Fergal Keane... Uh, BBC correspondent wrote the most extraordinary book detailing what he went through and these dreams, these appalling dreams that he had after Rwanda. Um, and it was the single most ghastly thing I've ever seen. I mean, we were witnessing people dying in front of us when, when eventually the, um, you know, it was the, Tutu, uh, the Hutus and the Tutsis and they forced out the Hutus eventually and they were sort of ended up um, hundreds of thousands on this sort of granite volcanic rock and just left to die. And, so it wasn't only the genocide, it was what followed it. And, and you just watched people die and children were dying and the fields were full of children mutilated. And it, it oh, was the right. most hideous thing. And, but I managed to somehow compartmentalise it. Yeah. When I, when I, and when I came back, I managed to get on my life. But a lot of people, um, a lot of journalists didn't and a lot of people, but, but, but you know, the, um, it was the single most dreadful thing. You also talk about in the book about your daughter and you, yeah. we came on here with her to speak yeah. about the documentary you made um, and about her, her battle with anorexia. Um, you were very honest in the documentary and also again in the book about how much at the beginning stages of that you didn't really understand anorexia and, and you felt at times that what she was doing was, was selfish. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I didn't understand it. And to be quite frank, I still don't completely, but I understand now that it's a mental illness. And what, that's what I didn't realise at the time. I thought it was some teenage fad. I thought that, you know, she, she just wasn't eating and she wanted to lose weight. It was around the time of her 18th birthday party. We had a big party for her and she, I just thought 
she, mm. you know, wanted to lose weight. And um, but then it was alarming, and she, you know, she really did start losing weight very, very quickly and uh, um, dramatically. And you know, we were confronted with this thing called anorexia, and you mm. lose your daughter, and your daughter is not your daughter. It's anorexia talking to you, and we fell out very badly. She, she was vile. And, terrible temper she thought I was appalling and we did we had no relationship during this illness so it, it and it tears families apart and yeah. it, you know it, um, I'm happy to say she pulled through but Thanks, so many please. people don't and you know the resources for it are so for mental health generally are not great they said there'd be parity between mental health and um, physical health is not really happening but it was a very dark time and you know you you really do feel as though your daughter is just wasting away and there's nothing you can do about yeah. it um, but she's okay now she is okay yeah Good. she 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 met a key worker a nurse who somehow spent a lot of time with her talked to her talked some sense into her and said look you can either go on like this and you will die um, or you can you know Try and find a life again where you've got some sort it's of. It's extraordinary is that you can you can spend your career uh, traveling around the world, understanding situations, under, uh, understanding tribal conflicts, um, battle zones, war zones, disasters. Yeah. But it's actually something that's much much closer to home. That's even harder to understand. Yeah, it really crashed in, and you know, you'd, and and I, I didn't appreciate what was going on. And it's a, you know, I think just people have to realise it's a mental illness and treat it as a mental illness. It's yeah. a, there is, you know, it's a it's a symptom of a yeah of a. No, the book, which is out on uh, on Thursday, uh, is called uh, "And Thank You for Watching." Yeah. Um, which, uh, which, when you were uh, presenting the news, that was your uh, that was your tagline. Well, that was your thing at the, at the end. end. And look, it's amazing. You know, you say a small thing like that, and people used to send emails and write in and go, "It's really nice that you say and thank you for watching at the end of the program." And yeah. so I just kept doing it, and it was and um, that's yeah. your thing. Yeah. It's your thing. Well, no, I mean it was a small <laughs> thing, but it's. <laughs> I couldn't think of another title either. So, <laughs> so, uh, and we should also we should also say uh, yeah. because you know it's sitting here with the bathroom. We've got two, darling. Have you uh, just got the one? No, you. <laughs> I know you've got plenty. No, no. So uh, you uh, you have your your two BAFTAs, you and have Emmy. your Emmy, uh, yeah. um, but but you do have said that there is something slightly uncomfortable about picking up awards for for what you've done. Uh, there's, it wasn't so much uncomfortable picking up the award. It was quite nice to do that. But I think some of my awards have been for stories that we've been discussing in yeah. the Haiti earthquake and terrible, in which, you know, thousands of people have been killed. And it is slightly incongruous mm. to get in black tie and go and get people sort of cheering and clapping and you, you sort of be being rewarded. And it did seem to me that, you know, you felt slightly exploitative of the, of the story that you do, of the people who are involved mm. in that, that you pick up an award. But, you know, the other hand, on the other hand, it's nice to be recognised and, it, uh, and it's nice to get awards, as you will testify. Yes, and, um, yes. And 30 years, it's amazing. Yeah, well, you. happy and thank you. You've done all the shows, obviously, so <laughs> all 30. So, <laughs> unlike you, Holly. You no, out. no, not quite, not quite. He's, he's been there from the beginning. <laughs> not quite, has not Philip. quite. Richard and Jude. You <laughs> might feel like that sometimes, yeah. but sometimes it does feel yeah. like But look that, at yeah. us now, you yeah, see, I know, this is I know. the thing. No, this is died. This is yours is died. <laughs> I'm, I know, black Mine. as raven's wing, mine. Mine's perfect. <laughs> um, Mine's lovely to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you.